I don't need much. I need. I don't need much. I want a lot. When nothing's working, that's when I work hard. And that's when I turn to music. Keep focused. Don't focus on getting bigger. Focus on getting better. With RBC X Music, it's not just about having a big brand behind you. It's about having someone say that I believe in your vision and I want to support that. I feel like I was brought into this super cool community of incredible artists from all across Canada. I see that music, no matter what's going on in the world, still brings people together. I feel like I'm a walking example of the exact thing that people told me I would never become. If there's something that you're passionate about, why give it up? There's no rhyme or reason to it. It just doesn't make sense. I can't stop. I won't, I won't stop. It's just a part of me, and I can't, I can't let it go. I'm always holding my community on my back. I was taught from an early age, don't walk in front of me, don't walk behind me, walk beside me as my friend. If someone tells you that what you're doing is too much, then tell them that they don't know what you can handle. RBC helped me put my music into motion. While we are gathering virtually today, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the importance of the land that we each call home. We do this to reaffirm our commitment to and responsibility for improving relationships between nations and our understanding of local Indigenous peoples and their cultures. We broadcast from Toronto, the traditional territory of the Mississaugas of the New Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. Today, it is home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. Please join us in a moment of reflection to consider how we can, each in our own way, move forward in the spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. I encourage you to seek out and embrace the works of Indigenous creators, artists, and academics. Hey everyone, you're watching episode five of the RBC Emerging Artists Academy. I'm your host, Ian Ketakum. In today's show, our experts will walk you through the financial literacy that all artists need to have and share tips and tools to help you navigate your finances as an emerging talent. We'll also profile exceptional Canadian artists, including artist and writer Jag Deep Reina, hip hop and R&B emerging artist duo, Ali Dice. So make sure you stick, stick, stick around. I'm thrilled to welcome our featured artist, Jagdeep Reina. Based in Guelph, Ontario, Jagdeep is an interdisciplinary artist whose practice involves drawing, painting, writing, photography, and textile embroidery. He teaches in the Department of Fine Arts and Music at the University of Guelph and holds an MFA in painting from the Rhode Island School of Design. His work speaks to social justice and the possibility of intersectional solidarities based on collective histories of community and migration. Let's take a look. I think what makes an artist an artist is being truly innovative in the way that you work and then having integrity behind that innovation. My name is Jake Deeprana and I'm an artist living and working in Guelph. I went to a school called the Rhode Island School of Design. It's like an art and design school. And I was there for two years. So it was a small program, it was 10 of us. You know, it was a really hard program, it was really rigorous. And I feel so lucky that I've had such great teachers and profs when I was going through art school. So the Punjabi Delhi was a bodega in the East Village of New York City that I used to love going to. And then slowly over time, I became really interested in the history of that space and like when it opened. So I started thinking a lot about the structure of the space as this kind of iconic monument to like the resilience of immigrant communities and how they come over to new places and like build homes for themselves. And the Delhi just started becoming really famous for all of us kind of in the South Asian diaspora. Like, and I eventually started making a whole series of paintings and drawings around it. My act of like memorializing that space. 
I mean, I think history is something that people can kind of view as homogenous or something that has a certain type of way and things were done in a certain type of way. And I'm really interested in kind of looking at that idea critically and thinking about how we can like dismantle homogeneity around history or around like storytelling or around historical memory. My kind of practice, it's always been quite research heavy and makes you realize that history isn't something that's fixed, but it's something that can be kind of taken apart and kind of dissected and something that artists can prod at and kind of look at critically. And that's kind of been the driving force behind like my work. I think my research with Fukari has really made me passionate about trying to kind of resurrect or preserve this type of artwork. It's a type of embroidered textile from the region of Punjab that in the 20th century was widely impacted by globalization and colonialism. It's a type of artwork that's dying out. It was something that was so revered and done in a, in a community setting. And so I just feel passionate about kind of resurrecting endangered skills and how I can kind of preserve that and learn that, especially when it's connected to kind of my larger history. I think being in Guelph already, it's really easy to stay focused here. And then I think with the additional lockdown, it's been able to kind of heighten my level of focus on my work. Still has like an overall pretty kind of quiet, and intimate and tight knit art scene. But I think instead of feeling lonely, I kind of just turned to my creativity and it allowed me to feel solitude and get through like just staying productive and keep working. Being an artist is going to mean different things for different people. Um, I think the only responsibility that any artist can have is just being honest with themselves and like being true to who they are. And if you do that, and you'll find your way as an artist. Thanks for sharing your artwork and story with us, Jagdeep. Now let's dive into today's topic, financial literacy for artists. Our presenters for today's workshop are Joshua Morawitz, Austin James, and Margaret Lewis from RBC's Commercial and Business Financial Services teams. Joshua is the Senior Relationship Manager of Media and Entertainment. Throughout his tenure, he's worked in personal banking, small business, and commercial banking. He now specializes in the media and entertainment industry, supporting businesses in the content and entertainment value creation chain. Austin is the business account manager for business markets and financial services. He supports a portfolio of 250 business clients. His portfolio covers several industry functions, including media and entertainment, real estate and construction, and business services and professionals. Margaret is the commercial account manager of media and entertainment. She's a Canadian entertainment and media insider with a lifelong passion for the industry. She holds an MBA from the University of Toronto's Rotman School of Management, and her experience spans from early roles at TIFF and NBC Universal to business operations at Chorus Entertainment, where she worked to facilitate and finance the licensing of original programming. She also is passionate about helping BIPOC creators bring their visions to the big screen. It sounds like an amazing group, so now I'll hand it over to RBC's workshop team. It's up to you all. Thanks Ian for that kind introduction. We're excited to be here to discuss the importance of financial literacy for emerging artists. Today, we'll be focusing on key areas to set your business up for success, including shifting from personal to business, building your team, business structures, managing cash flow, engaging with the bank, and leveraging the resources available to you. This is a topic the team here is passionate about. We've got a lot of ground to cover, so I'll hand it over to Austin to kick us off. Thanks, Josh. Ple pleasure to be here with everybody today. Hope you have um, you know, a notepad ready. We're gonna give you lots of good information. Um, so let's start with the basics. And really what we wanna leave you with today is some easy, actionable steps uh, that may be useful for you moving forward. So um, let's begin with what does it mean to move from personal to business banking? And what are a few steps and key pieces of information I may need to take with me uh, to, to make good decisions through that process? So you have your creative side hustle project or idea, and you're ready to put your boots on the ground. What does that mean from a banking perspective? Well, the best advice we can provide is when it comes to when it comes to the correct timing of moving from personal banking to business banking is to transition as soon as possible. Simply put, once you've decided that your idea or project is going to be monetized, 
It's important to stay organized and separate your business funding, spending, and reporting from that of your personal day-to-day -day life. Believe me, when it comes to tax time and your bookkeeper or accountant is asking to go through 12 months of personal credit card and bank account statements to determine what was a business transaction and what was a personal, you'll thank us. Well, what does that really mean when I say separate your personal banking and business banking? Well, simply put, you will open a whole new business banking profile, which is owned by your registered business versus you personally. Within that profile, you may have a day-to-day -day business checking account, a savings account, and perhaps a business credit card, which we'll talk a little bit later into our session. Think about your business as being its very own living, breathing individual, and you're the director and decision maker that are for everything that happens. The three key takeaways for opening your business banking profile are, one, setting up your business structure as the owner of the profile with your banker. Two, enabling an online banking access point for you to manage your business banking efficiently online. Three, activating the basic banking products they're gonna help you send, receive, and manage your business operations, such as a business checking, business savings, and business credit card. It can be a most important first step in formalizing your business administration, and yet is also the simplest. However, we always recommend you leverage your network for guidance along the way. Before you make the call to speak with your banker, connect with your network. There are surely other business owners who have successfully navigated the business banking world and will be able to share their experiences with you, this gives you a chance to share and deepen your relationships with your peer-to-peer -peer relationships while gaining the knowledge they have already acquired through their own successes and stumbles. Lastly, be prepared to do your own research and own your decisions. Make sure you spend an appropriate amount of time to understand your business trajectory and what makes you an educated individual on that topic. Aside from reaching out to your network and discussing with your banker, continue to, to participate in business courses, workshops, which will enable you to embrace the challenges ahead with confidence. Now, over to Margaret, who will discuss the importance of building your professional team for success. Awesome. Thank you so much, Austin. Uh, it's really great to be here with everyone. Those were some really great insights around moving from personal to business. Now, let's discuss what's important when building your team. There are three partnerships we believe are important to establish right off the bat as each of you look to build your businesses. The first is the bank. Establishing a relationship with the bank early on is key. The bank is where you're going to house your first dollar and of course your subsequent dollars. So going to your local branch and learning about what options are available to you from a small business perspective in terms of bank accounts and credit cards is essential to building a solid foundation for your business as an emerging artist. Also, establishing a relationship with an advisor early on is key as well, and having regular touch points with that advisor to ensure that you are leveraging the right products and the right advice or expertise for the stage in which your business is at. Another important partnership to establish early on in your business, especially um, these early emerging days, is that of an accountant, more specifically an entertainment accountant. Speaking to an entertainment accountant early on to understand what controls you can put into place um, very early in your business is key to developing a solid foundation, such as online platforms that can help you track receipts and spending for your business, as Austin had mentioned earlier. Also, use these early stages of your business to educate yourself on the services and knowledge that an accountant can provide by asking as many questions as you can. For example, what do accountants typically help small businesses with? How much do their services cost? This is really helpful for planning and budgeting purposes. And what are the tax and liability implications You know, when you're registering your business and when your business is fully up and running? The third most important partnership to establish early on alongside the bank and accountant is that of a lawyer. Speaking to an entertainment lawyer early on is important for understanding any of the legal implications. So by asking questions and educating yourself, you will continue to build that solid foundation. Asking questions such as what services do they provide for artists who are in emerging stages just as you are? Um, or what sort of expertise do they have in the area of the industry that you're in is also key. And how much do their services cost once again so you can factor that into your planning and budgeting for your business? The reality is that lawyers are expensive, 
but their expertise can literally turn a couple hundred dollars into a couple thousands of dollars or vice versa they can help you save a couple of thousand dollars down the line so while lawyers can be pricey they are definitely a worthy investment for your business's future just remember as you seek to build these partnerships don't think that you have to reinvent the wheel Leverage your network of business owners and mentors in the industry to potentially refer you to accountants and lawyers that they use. You definitely don't want you definitely want to ensure you are going to lawyers and accountants that are specific to the media and entertainment industry. And this is because they will have a nuanced understanding of the industry, the laws and the regulations that are associated with it. Now I will hand it over to Josh, who will speak to you more about business structure. Thanks very much, Margaret. Now that we've established who you need on your team, you need to decide how to structure your business. It's important to understand that a business structure is the legal structure of an organization in a given jurisdiction. For example, a business incorporated in Ontario. There are three main business structures that will speak to the basics of today. Prior to making a decision and determining what is most appropriate for you, you should involve the guidance of an accountant and lawyer to help make that decision. Each structure has significant different tax and liability obligations that an accountant and lawyer are best suited to advise on. The first structure is a sole proprietorship, which is the simplest business structure. This typically just involves one individual that owns and operates the business. The owner is fully responsible for any liabilities of the business. Income and business related expenses are typically considered that of the owner. The second is a partnership, of which there are two types, general partnerships and limited liability partnerships. For the purpose of today's discussion, I'll briefly cover some basic information on general partnerships. If your business is owned and operated by multiple individuals, it may be prudent to have a partnership. In a general partnership, the partners manage the company together and assume the responsibility for the partnership liabilities together. Similar to a sole proprietorship, the partners are fully responsible for any liabilities of the business. A partnership does not pay tax on its own, however, passes through profits and losses, or losses, pardon me, to the individual partners. Lastly is a corporation. This is a more complex and, well, more expensive business structure. For example, a corporation is recognized as an independent legal entity separate of its owners. It files and pays its own taxes. As a result, a corporation typically requires more regulations and tax requirements to comply with. One of the main benefits typically sought after with a corporation is that the owners or shareholders are typically not responsible for the corporation's debt. In making the decision of which business structure to pursue, it is paramount to involve an accountant and a lawyer to receive the most applicable advice to help you make an informed decision. Things to consider could be the simplicity versus complexity of your business, how many people are involved, and what is the ownership structure. There are significant differences in how taxation and liabilities are approached with each structure. So again, I would like to emphasize you need to involve an accountant and lawyer to guide you in making the most appropriate decision. I would also like to encourage you to build your network of industry peers and mentors and leverage it to gain insight on how they initially structured their business. Be sure to ask whether their initial structure set them up for success as they grew their business and why or why not. In addition to this, build a business plan. This will help guide you through which business structure is appropriate and when it's time to move from one business structure to another. Understand where your business is now, where you want to be in a year, three years, five years, and how you intend on getting there. Understand and identify your strengths and weaknesses and opportunities. Understand who your competition is and how you differ. Use your business plan as a working document, not a blueprint. Revisit your business plan frequently and update it accordingly based on how you're progressing. It'll help you define success. Building a business plan is a very worthwhile exercise as it encourages you to put pen to paper and artic articulate uh, what, your, what your objectives are. It'll help you grow your business as you determine and modify your key success factors and what steps you're, you plan on taking to achieve them. It'll help your accountant and lawyer and banker support you through this growth as it helps clearly articulate where you are and where you want to go. A significant component of a business plan is also understanding the importance of budgeting and managing cash flow. Cash flow is the lifeblood of any business. To speak further to this, I'd like to pass the conversation back over to Margaret. Thank you so much, Josh. Um, as an emerging artist, the next area you should really bring your attention and focus to, as Josh had mentioned, is determining your business's budgets and cash flow. Some of the things you'd want to think about is how you can access more capital, aka accessing more money, how do you establish credit for your business, and why is cash flow support important? So when thinking about the ways to access more capital, think about the fact that Canada's arts industry is built on a funding model. There are federal, provincial and citywide grants or funding for many aspects of the arts. 
These grants and funding can help you tap into the money or the capital that you need for your business. So it's important to make sure that you're doing your research on which grants and types of capital are out there. Once again, a common thing that we've mentioned throughout this session so far is leveraging mentors and other established business owners within the industry for advice and guidance. Because as we said, you shouldn't have to reinvent the wheel. Also, take a look at festivals as they may offer grants or workshops on access, accessing capital specific to the industry, to the area of the industry that you are in. If you are Black, Indigenous, and a person of color, the racial reckoning within the industry has opened doors to grants that are geared towards communities that have long been marginalized, marginalized from receiving the adequate access and opportunity. So take some time to research to see if there are grants specific to your community that you can leverage as well. Be advised that some government grants may require your business to be fully registered or incorporated. Such grants in the film and television industry, such as Ontario Creates, Telefilm, and CMF, also known as a Canada Media Fund. So be sure to take the time to understand all the guidelines and eligibility before you start your application. As you think about cash flow for your company at these early stages, you also want to think about establishing credit for your company early on as well. The way you establish good credit for your business is like the way you establish good credit for your personal finances. You want to ensure that you aren't spending more cash than what your business can afford. And you want to make sure that you're making your monthly debt payments on time and, of course, consistently. One question that we always get from business owners, especially those in the early stages of their business like you guys, is why do I even need credit? Let's be honest. Credit has gotten a really bad rap and a really bad name because of the very well-known consequences that it has. But the reality is that credit is really an effective way of managing your cash flow, your accounts receivable, which is the money that you receive as an art emerging artist, and the payables, which is your expenses. For example, a business credit card is the easiest and the most effective cash flow tool you can get. For starters, it helps you to separate your business spending from your personal spending. Secondly, it really does allow you to stretch your cash. For example, if you are a musician who has booked a performance that's halfway across the country, instead of, your of using your cash up front before you've been paid for the gig, you can use the business credit card to take care of your expenses for the performance. So once you've been paid, you can pay off your credit card on time, of course, and not incur any extra expenses or interest charges. And so investing in a business credit card is not only a great way to build up credit for your business, but to help you separate your personal from your business, as well as to help you build solid financial routines and manage your cash. The reality is that cash flow is important because it's gonna be a big determinant of how much credit you can borrow down the line. As your business grows, your credit needs will definitely grow. So you wanna make sure that you are establishing the right foundation for your business by ensuring that your debt obligations don't heavily outweigh the cash flowing for your business from your day-to-day -day operations. Having really good financial controls in place, even at the early emerging stage that you are at, is really important for setting a foundation for sustainable and growing business in the future. Now I'll let I will let Austin speak to when to engage the bank for advice. Thanks, Margaret. Some really good tips there. Uh, I think we can all take away. Uh, always a good reminder, even for us to talk about the basics, because you're, you know, really making good decisions in any business, whether you're an emerging artist um, or you run, you know, a retail store, it doesn't matter. It comes down to being prepared, being organized, and having the right information to make the right decisions. So, uh, you know, thank you uh, again, Margaret. Now that we have a good sense of budgeting, cash flow, and credit, you know, let's discuss when to engage your banker for advice. And and the short answer is immediately. Uh, as Margaret discussed earlier, having a professional team who are there for you along every step of the way is an essential part of running a successful business, um, whether you're an emerging artist or any other business, as I mentioned. We are here to help you accomplish that goal. And unless we know what's going on in your, in your life, in your business, what challenges you are facing, it's impossible to provide the right level of trusted strategic advice. Whether it's your first conversation with your banker, as we alluded to early on, maybe it's when you're opening your first account, or you have a steady line of communication well underway, and you may have already gone through several business cycles. Don't hesitate to reach out, call or send an email. The journey of a creative entrepreneur is unique with many decisions to be made along the way, and we're here to help. 
Earlier, we talked about when to move from business to personal banking. Well, how about once your business has grown? Perhaps you need to hire employees, delegate some of your banking responsibilities, or deal with a new group of clients or vendors who may be out of country and dealing in different currencies. These are all new challenges, which we need to be addressed and navigated accordingly. Be sure to leverage the expertise of your banker who can provide solutions tailored to your business. Don't be shy. We all, we're not expecting any of our clients to be experts in the field that they're in from a banking perspective. That's why we are there to help you. So call and reach out every time that you do have a question that comes up. Many artists will go through project cycles. This means that you may very well be acquainted with opening new businesses and corresponding banking solutions for each of them along the way. However, your experiences, challenges, and the successes for each one of those project cycles may look very different. So don't be afraid to address different yet similar conversations at, along, uh, at each experience along the way. Now, what about when my business has successfully produced great outcomes and I'm left with a healthy balance of cash? Well, this is a goal for everyone. Produce an exceptional piece of art and find that the world truly appreciates it. Once again, this answer comes back to obtaining the right advice from your professional team. This may be a great time to expand that professional network from what we discussed earlier to financial planning. These are all partners that we leverage inside of the bank and outside of the bank to make sure that you have the correct advice um, in your field to make best decisions at your, uh, at your disposal. Now, I'm going to pass this back to Josh for some useful resources for you to take away after today's session. Thanks very much, Austin. In this last part, we're going to discuss where to find available resources and how to leverage them effectively in your business. So we've covered a lot of ground so far, but at the end of the day, find opportunities and resources to make your life easier. You don't need to be the first person to go through this, and chances are you probably won't be the last. I would encourage you to look into companies like Owner, a platform that pairs technology with support and resources to simplify the process of starting a business through automating business formation and everyday legal work. Use companies like GrantMatch, firms that help identify various and sundry government funding for business owners. I would also encourage you to research and leverage industry-specific resources and organization, as Margaret had mentioned. And I would start with Ontario Creates, as this is a provincial government agency mandated to be a catalyst for economic development, investment, in collaboration on, in Ontario's creative industries. There are even further specialized independent organizations within each industry. For example, in film, there's a Canadian Media Producers Association. In music, you have Music Canada or Canadian Live Music Association. For animation, you have Computer Animation Studios of Ontario. And lastly, and pardon me, those are just a few to, 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 to name off the top of my head, but there's, there's so many out there. But lastly, like, work with your bank. We're working hard to be part of the industry ecosystem and through events like this and partnerships like the Emerging Artists Program, we're eager to provide advice to people like yourselves. As I mentioned, these are just a few examples of organizations out there that are designed to support creatives and I would encourage you to do your research and do not be afraid to reach out to people in the industry and ask questions. And on that note, Margaret, back to you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Josh. Thank you so much, Austin. That's all the time we have today. We really do hope that you were able to take in some really great tips and advice. Please do stay tuned for a one pager with even more resources and takeaways. The PDF will be linked here in the chat box and also email to everyone who registered. Lastly, want to thank the team once again here for sharing their knowledge and their advice. I hope our audience of emerging artists really found these tools, these tools and tips helpful. I'll pass it back over to you, Ian. A big thank you to Margaret, Joshua, and Austin for joining us. Next up, we profile this episode's emerging artists, Canadian hip hop and R&B duo, Ally Dice. Identical twin sisters, Kayla and Kaylee Ally Dice, were introduced to reggae and dancehall at age four when their mother discovered that they could sing. At 12, a local Boys and Girls Club member took an interest in the twins' music and began taking them to a recording studio located within Toronto's St. Albans Boys and Girls Club. For over 12 years, they've been performing around Toronto, perfecting their original sound. 
Ali Dice took home the grand prize at the 2020 Canada's Walk of Fame RBC Emerging Musician Program and are currently working on their highly anticipated EP set to release this fall 2021. Here to perform their song Grow, I'm pleased to present to you Ali Dice. Never saw you as the enemy. See you as a stepping stone to get to where I need to be. Crazy how I'm great enough to graduate the rockery. The rockery. I need to be. How in the hell was I ever supposed to grow? I opened up that door. I banged that man for more. I guess I needed more. How in the hell was I ever supposed to Better bow down to the little black queen Had to move right before I left them on the scene Before my bro favors had to show them what I mean Look, this ain't what I meant when I said I needed more Hopping at the bends, I guess I'm leaving out the score Said that we was fighting, so I put the shit on ice Down for whatever, but forever ain't life Even if I told you I was hella bent Showed you all the bills cause I was hella spent Taking me for granted, yeah, it's relevant No, I'm heaven sent, I'm heaven sent how in the hell was I ever supposed to grow? I opened up that door. I begged that man for more. I guess I needed more. How in the hell was I ever supposed to grow? I opened up that door. I begged that man for more. I guess I needed more. What a captivating performance. Mm -mm -mm. Thank you, Kayla and Kaylee. Well, that wraps up today's show and our final episode of the RBC Emerging Artists Academy. A special thanks to our guest experts and most importantly, to the artist community for joining us. If you've got something to say, remember, the conversation doesn't have to stop here. Give us a shout online using the hashtag RBC Emerging Artists. You can also catch up on all the episodes on elevate.ca. Stay safe, take care of one another, peace.